Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Abderrahman Elofir, and I am the deputy CEO of the Durish World Group. I want to thank you for taking the time to attend this video conference about the first half year and numbers of the group Durish World. We will be happy to answer your questions after the presentations. After the presentation, and now I will lead the floor to Pierre Condolier, the group CFO, for the presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for attending. Um, we have disclosed our press release uh, uh, 15 minutes ago. The slideshow that we will go through is also available uh, on our website. And uh, the um, half year report will be available uh, later in the evening. Uh, we will go through the slides. After that, uh, you can uh, answer questions. Uh, through the chat, uh, which you can um, see with a question mark at the upper part of the, your screen. So, I, and we will take, uh, I, I tell it to you right now, we will take the question in two parts. First, the questions about our half year results, and if there are some questions about the earlier investment, because I know that some of you are very interested in that, we will answer to them in a second part. So the key consideration and the key takeout message for the half year results is that the group delivered an outstanding performance. Uh, this is indeed the best results uh, in the in the uh, six month period for the group. Uh, we have delivered uh, 2.5 billion revenue, uh, 250 million uh, EBITDA and uh, 118 uh, net income over the six month period. Uh, for those who know us for a while, uh, often for full year results, we didn't have such uh, numbers. Uh, and the last, um, uh, if we take uh, the, because we, we started consolidating ECHO uh, on uh, 17th of December, but if we had consolidated ECHO on a 12 month basis, the EBITDA of the group would have been 559 million euro. If we go uh, a little more in the detail, the revenue is uh, 2 billion 500 million euros, which is an increase by 54% uh, compared to prior year. The EBITDA is 200 and, uh, uh, million euro, an improvement by 45%. Current EBIT is 175 million euro, an improvement by 55%. And net income attributable to shareholders is 119 million euro, which is an increase by 60%. Uh, the the ECHO uh, acquisition took place on uh, December 17th. Uh, we are working on the implementation of the remedies asked by the European, Com European Commission. You will see that uh, we have an increase in revenue in both divisions, 70% uh, in, um, in the environmental services in the context of uh, this scope effect and also higher prices uh, compared to prior year um, in the recycling division. Uh, there are also lower underlying volumes for ferro scrap on the same scope basis by 10% roughly which was already the case when we disclosed the press release uh, after our general meeting of shareholders. You will see that uh, our unit margin were satisfactory, that ECHO uh, brought 44.8 uh, million EBITDA over 3.5 months, uh, testifying once again the group capacity or ability to integrate targets. You will see also that we have uh, some increase in energy and staff cost. In the multi-service, there is also a positive trend uh, in the revenue uh, by 9%, an increase by 9%, um, with a good recovery in aeronautics, cleaning in the Spain and Portugal, that the EBITDA is stable in that division. Uh, we have a little less EBITDA in the cleaning. Last year, we, have, we had some, um, I would say, additional services in the cleaning in, due to COVID context, which 
uh, I would say luckily we did not have to the same extent this year, but these servi services were profitable. And this is partly offset by a good recovery in aeronautics. In the environmental service, we had some uh, good margins and promising first months of eco integration. The revenue increases by 70% and the EBDA by 51%. Uh, the EBDA stands at 232 million. The current EBIT is uh, 170 million, uh, which is 58% better than last year. We have uh, hardly any non recurring item which translates into an EBIT by 171.4 million euro, which is 78.7% um, uh, better than last year. The fuel scrap volume have increased by 20% compared to last year, but uh, most of this increase is a scope effect, and it is due to the eco acquisition. Uh, as I told before, without this acquisition, the volumes would have been down by 10% on the same scope basis. Indeed, the manufacturing issues in the automotive industry um, led to a decrease in scrap purchases on two parts of our uh, entries. The end of life vehicles, of course, if uh, less vehicles are, are manufactured, uh, the customers have to keep for a longer time their old vehicle. And uh, automotive industry is also a big producer of uh, steel waste. And if you do not, if you manufacture less auto, uh, um, vehicles, you have less waste. This results uh, in a shortage of fuel scrap for our customers and translated into higher prices. For non ferrous metal volumes, the increase is by either 23%. Once again, it is mainly a scope effect due to eco acquisition, as volumes were stable on a sta same scope basis. Uh, unit margin margins have improved both for ferrous and non ferrous metal. And for, I would say that uh, at the end of March, or the month of March, uh, we tapped some uh, historically high prices. I would just uh, once one word. Uh, no, we will speak about that in the perspective of the context of what's going on in our industry. So on that slide, you see the change in commodity prices. You see that during the semester, the six month period, we have had some increases um, for ferrous scrap prices, but also for non ferrous metals and that from April or May on uh, the trend is a bit reversing. So we have already uh, spoken about these numbers, 20% uh, volume increase in ferro scrap, but decreased by 10% of underlying volumes and increased by 23% for the 3.5 months uh, for non ferrous metal that uh, and flat underlying volumes. I would just speak about the price uh, effect because you will see that uh, for the ferrous scrap, the revenue increased by 73% uh, with a 20% volume effect. And for the non ferrous metals, the revenue increased by 81% with a 23% volume effect. Uh, a bridge about the EBITDA in the environmental uh, service division. Uh, last year, we had uh, for the six month period an EBITDA uh, by uh, 153.3 million euro. Uh, we have an improvement in the commercial margin for the same scope uh, business. It does not include uh, the eco contribution by 52.4 million euro, uh, which is uh, partly uh, negative volume effect on ferro scrap, stable volume effect on um, uh, non ferrous metals and positive uh, improvement in margins for both uh, segments. Uh, this is partly offset by uh, decrease in, uh, service, uh, in service income. Um, 
increase in employee cost and increase in energy, energy cost. Uh, over the years, this energy cost will be higher because most of this energy cost, uh, or at least for electricity, started in January. Then in green, you see the contribute the what uh, ECO brought as a BDA for the since uh, December, which is 44.8 million euros. So you see that the first months are very, very good. And the EBDA for the six months for the recy recycling and the environmental service division is 232 million euros. A few words about the um, about the household waste collection. Uh, we have a slight improvement in uh, in services and a roughly slight also EBDA at 12 million euro. A few words uh, about the rationale of the ECO or of uh, ECO acquisition. Um, the rationale is that we want to increase our, our footprint on the metallic scrap market, both ferrous and non-ferrous, uh, at a time when the group expects that the demand will uh, accelerate in the coming year due to the fight about, uh, against global warming. Um, we will speak into more details uh, about that in the perspective and forecast um, section. And also we can uh, expect uh, additional volumes uh, for our niche markets on the volume that ECHO collects. You see on the low parts of the slides um, a few uh, metrics from ECHO. Uh, we we concluded the acquisition on December 17th after uh, uh, receiving the authorization to proceed uh, by the European Commission on December 16. Uh, we have taken some commitments um, towards the Euro European Commission in order to be authorized to proceed to the acquisition. We have tried uh, on a single slide to sum up, summarize <laughs> Uh, months of discussions uh, with uh, with them. Um, so you see uh, the different uh, step of the value chain in column, collection, valorization and trade. And uh, in the few lines, the several specific pro products that they have identified, uh, ferrous metallic waste, non-ferrous metallic waste, and they have also identified specific markets, end of life vehicles, wheels and batteries. And then you see for each uh, inch uh, uh, line and column uh, in green, there was a hardly any overlap and uh, few uh, competition issues. In yellow, there was a few competition issues, and in red, there were more competition issues. Which results uh, in the rem remedies which we proposed to, to the European Commission in order to give their authorization. We have to dispose a uh, four valorization site equipped with a shredder in France and uh, four collecting sites. Um, we have also taken uh, specific commitments uh, in order to uh, ensure the viability of the sites site when they are sold. Uh, where is the process uh, as of now? We have selected one bidder for the takeover of all the remedy scope. Uh, we are discussing the legal doc documentation and the signing is expected by uh, mid of June. After that, the purchaser has to be uh, accepted by the European Commission, uh, but so they are aware of the discussion that we have uh, currently. And uh, the bidder must also uh, file its uh, antitrust returns. So we, we expect a closing by uh, autumn uh, 2022. Multi-service, you know that we have also the multi-service division, which was acquired uh, in the mid 20s um, through the purchase of the Penoy Poly Service. It is a business which has a different economic uh, cycle. Uh, which is a contract business um, and uh, which is more, I would say, uh, predictable uh, as we, there are some uh, contracts. Uh, so most of it is uh, tertiary cleaning uh, service to energy. 
Uh, we have also uh, industry services, which are uh, outsourcing of uh, services for the automotive industry. How HR in interim where we provide temporary staff and uh, one specific division where we provide uh, urban spaces uh, services. So the revenue increases by 8.9%. The EBITDA is stable, nearly stable, and uh, as well for the EBIT. You have a more detailed flavor of the services and of the change of each division in, on that slide. The tertiary um, solution increased by 4.3%. Cleaning France is stable, um, which is already good because last year we have additional service, uh, which we had to a lesser extent this year. Cleaning for Spain in Portugal increases by 8%. But and energy increased by 4%. Industry solution, it's uh, uh, in aeronautics services, it increased by 42%, which is very good. The division recovers well. After two difficult years in the COVID context, the momentum is very good. Not yet back to back yet to pre-COVID levels, but uh, recovering, sourcing, uh, uh, HR increased by 7%. Uh, it's a mix of um, organic growth and also uh, recovery in temporary staff and services to aeronautics, which recovers later than uh, outsour our outsourcing uh, services, but it is very underst understandable. Um, all the companies which are uh, in that business, uh, they first find businesses for their own employee and then they add on top of that uh, temporary staff when uh, their own employee are fully employed. And that's the reason why uh, this division is a little back in the growth, but it should increase over the second half. Urban management, uh, maintenance, sorry, increased by 16.7%. And uh, there are three or four subsidiaries in, the, in that division and they all increase their revenue nearly to the same extent. If we, if we look at the EBITDA, uh, we have a decrease in, by 2.8 million um, in the tertiary division. One million is explain, uh, explained by a non recurring cost on the contract. Indeed, a contract that uh, did not start. We had uh, non reliable customers, but we had the uh, committed to some uh, costs and we are trying to recover them from it from him but it's not uh, certain uh, as of now and the other 1.8 million is uh, the impact of uh, the lesser uh, covid services in the industry the EBIT improved by 1.7 million as a result of the revenue increase uh, recruiting is becoming the new difficulty, which is indeed uh, good news. Uh, sourcing HR, the EBITDA increased by 1.7 million euro uh, due to overhead savings in, in the context of the merger of the three subsidiary, which were active priorly in that division, and also improvement in revenue. Urban maintenance, the uh, EBITDA decreased by uh, 0. Uh, 7 million euro. Uh, indeed, uh, the most of the decrease comes from uh, one subsidiary where we have uh, a number of difficulties uh, and we are negotiating the disposal of that subsidiary uh, for the time being. On the holding part, uh, not much to say. Uh, Nothing significant, you can read everything on the side. On the balance sheet side, uh, you see that uh, most lines of the balance sheet change significantly, which is due to the ECO acquisition. Uh, so, and what I want to say for that page is that we have a, a preliminary goodwill for the ECO acquisition, which is 231 million euros. We will finalize uh, this goodwill for the uh, September accounts. Uh, equity, uh, this is the higher equity which we ever recorded in the group. 
and debt. Uh, we, of course, there is an increase in the debt, which is due to the eco acquisition. We, you will see with more details on the next page. Uh, we had uh, in September a debt of uh, 195.7 million euro. As you see the big brick, which is the eco acquisition, uh, 423 million euro, which is roughly the enterprise value of eco, which we, we have acquired. Uh, you will, our EBDA, which is in green, you see that a significant part of this EBDA is offset by an additional working capital requirement. Uh, a few words on that. The 97.7 million euro. This is the increase in uh, working capital requirement for the historical Deutsche Bourg uh, business, and uh, the, also the increase at ECO, but only since December uh, 17th. Why is this increase in working capital? Uh, you will see when we have an, our annual report that our inventories have increased uh, very much. Uh, because uh, it's not the quantities. Quantities, they have a, a little increase, but it's mainly the unit prices, uh, as we have historic prices, historic high prices, um, and that we, uh, we have an inventory, the value has increased significantly. Um, we expect that uh, it will, to most of the extent, reverse over the second half of the year, uh, because the, the prices may be a little lower, and also we have some, uh, I would say, also synergies with the eco acquisition at the level of inventory, which we have not uh, incurred yet. CapEx uh, is uh, 78 million euro, um, which is, uh, I would say, lower than we expect compared to our EBITDA. Uh, we, indeed, we have committed to lower, uh, higher commitments, uh, capex than that, but our suppliers, uh, they have problems to deliver us. Uh, semiconductors, uh, logistic disruption, and uh, I would say that capex they will come over H2 and also next year. Uh, and I recall our guidance uh, to be roughly below 50% on a multi-year basis uh, compared to our EBITDA. Uh, the other um, break uh, income tax, uh, 35 uh, million euro, it will increase significantly over H2. Uh, the dividends, uh, there will be no other dividends over the uh, second part of the year. I, remember, I recall the dividend policy of the group, which is to pay a maximum 30% uh, dividend compared to prior year net income. And um, we have reclassified uh, some assets according to IFRS 5 uh, to be disposed uh, in the context of the remedies that we have to sell in towards the, because of the commitments that we have taken with the European Commission and also due to the subsidiary which is under disposal and this results into a reclassification of debt of, of 14 million euro. Um, the last 12 months pro forma EBITDA is, uh, as I said before, 559 million euro. Uh, this does not take into account the effect of uh, remedies which will have to come. This will, will be roughly, uh, I would say, 4% of the EBITDA. And the pro forma leverage ratio is currently 1.12. Uh, we will go very rapidly into that pages, just to say that at the end of March, we have a very good headroom on our liquidity, nearly 600 million euros. And that we have also very good visibility on our credit lines. Uh, the first significant credit line to mature is our factoring facility, which matures um, uh, on uh, December uh, 23. Uh, but uh, every year we, it's rolling on a yearly basis. I will leave the, give the floor to uh, Abderrahman El Aoufir for the outlook uh, of the group. Thank you, Pierre. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's very confident in the future of the recycling industry. 
we are seeing that the European Union is pushing for the decarbonization of the industry. A lot of steel makers are uh, planning to switch their steel production from blast furnace to electric arc furnace, which will trigger uh, more consumption of uh, scrap. And for us, this will keep a high level of prices. So we are very confident in the future and all this will happen in the coming three or four years. Uh, in terms of uh, ECOR acquisition, we are uh, working now on the implementation of the second part. We have already achieved, I would say, 50% of the 50 to 60% of the, the synergies. We are now working on the second part of the, the synergies. This will happen between, uh, I would say, September and December uh, the, 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 this year. And we are also um, expecting to benefit from the synergies and the decision in terms of CAPEX that we have implemented two years ago in, in Spain. We have um, invested in a second lead furnace, which will start in the second week of June. And we have also increased the, uh, the treatments of the WE, the waste of electrical and electronic equipment uh, by 50%. And the, also this will start in July. So we are confident, you know, for, uh, the, for the long term uh, in the perspectives of the industry. It is true that here and there we are talking about recession because of the events, I mean, geopolitical events that are happening now taking place in Europe since three months now and it may we we may have a slowdown of the activity we may have uh, a recession but this is will be for the short term but for the long term we are very confident that our business model will continue for the multi-service we have over the last five years showed that there is a very good uh, uh, trading dynamic and it is now accelerating with the aeronautics uh, business because uh, as we have seen uh, now that I mean uh, we are going back to a normal situation and the flights are back and you know the, the, the demand for example for new uh, airplanes are very strong and this is will help us to to recover this uh, sector that have suffered a lot from the pandemic in the past. So overall, very positive about the future. I think now I am just OK. So you, you, you see here the next step of our uh, financial year. Um, I will now uh, speak about uh, an event which uh, did not take place uh, over the H1, it took place more recently, but uh, I know that uh, many of you uh, are interested in uh, that and that uh, some of you have a question about this, uh, which is uh, the minority stake, uh, which we have uh, the group purchased in Elior. Um, first, some facts. Uh, on the 19th of May, uh, there were the announcements that, uh, of the purchase of a minority stake in Elior, uh, 47, 47, 14.7 percent purchased from uh, uh, BIM, which is controlled by uh, Elior's co-founder Robert Zolad and uh, also Vilko Jean. Uh, the rich group becomes Elior's large, largest shareholder. The best price is uh, 5.65 euro per share, plus a possible earn out uh, capped at uh, one, uh, one euro and 35 cents, but only if the share price increases over uh, 5 uh, euro and 65 cents, which will be, uh, will be very happy if it takes place. Uh, of course, there are some uh, usual provisions. It will be uh, paid in, uh, before June's uh, 30th, and the rich board uh, held already 4.93% of the company purchased on the stock exchange, which results in a 19.6 stake. You see on the uh, lower left part of the page the um, Acor chest, uh, Elior, sorry, change uh, in the share price over the five past years. You see that um, until the start of the pandemic, 
uh, the company, uh, the share price was uh, steadily over 12 euro, that it's um, decreased significantly uh, with the uh, COVID. And there was, I would say, a second state of uh, decrease after the former CEO resigned. Um, the average for one year is uh, 5.41 euro. The premium of the basic price is 4% over that. Over the six months average, the premium is 27%. Uh, and of course, over more recent uh, three months, for example, the premium is 80% 80, 80 because the, the share decreased significantly. We have filed on the 20th of May with the IMF a declaration of intent for the next six months. Uh, we have the possibility to increase our shareholding uh, up to 30% maximum. Uh, we have no intent to launch a takeover bid. We, have, we are supportive of the board of directors and we intend to ask for two seats at the board of directors. Um, I'm sure that many of you have uh, questions about uh, because we have read in the, in the press release in some analyst investor in the newspaper uh, that some there are some questions of uh, uh, the rationale of this minority stake purchase purchase is that there are here we will be happy to um, to answer your questions uh, but what we can say uh, that uh, for mega contracts in the facility management uh, for CAC 40 customers or largest international customers, uh, they offer uh, outsource uh, together uh, the catering and the cleaning. And the uh, catering, the rich book, we did not have that activity in our portfolio. And often either we cannot uh, answer to this contract or we have to find a partner to answer to this, uh, to this contract. What we hope that, uh, of course, with respect to uh, independence of both groups and competition regulations, uh, that we will be uh, uh, for our multi-service division in a better position to answer this large facility management contracts. There are also uh, there is also a service division uh, at AIO, uh, which is uh, smaller that. Uh, the um, the Risburg multi-service uh, division and maybe there can be also some uh, I would say good uh, practice uh, of course always with being paying attention uh, with, with meeting the criteria of competition regulation and independence of both group that there can be maybe some uh, cooperation uh, uh, with both groups but first as a we already said uh, we will have two seats at the board. We do not control the company. Uh, we will observe uh, what happens at the board and we are supportive of the board of directors. Uh, many of you are familiar with uh, the Elior group, uh, which has two divisions, the contract catering and the facility management solution. Uh, which is uh, a group which is number three in catering in Europe, but number one in France, number one in Spain, number one in Italy. So you see many uh, very big uh, places and a large market share, number five in the USA. Last year, uh, 3.7 billion euro revenue um, in, uh, for the group, uh, only 100 million EBDA, but in the past, the EBDA was in the region of, uh, I would say, 300 million euro. Um, and 99,000 employees. Uh, so catering is 90% uh, of the revenue. Services 10%. Geography 46% France. International 54%. And you see that re the revenue is well balanced between business and industry, education and healthcare. Of course, we are aware of the challenges of the company uh, that the, the, in the in business and industry uh, post COVID, the, the revenue will uh, certainly not come back rapidly to pre COVID level uh, and that we can expect uh, that it comes more rapidly to pre COVID level in education and healthcare. So that's all for our uh, sorry for being so long, but we uh, we are happy to discuss in detail our results and also to speak about 
uh, also this uh, minority stake purchase in uh, LEO. Uh, we can you can ask some questions through the chat, which is the questions and answer um, button in the low, low upper part. Uh, we already have some questions. We will answer first the question about the results and then the question about LEO. So there are some questions uh, about the group results, uh, which are the details of the synergy expected and uh, quantify them, and um, what would be the revenue without ECHO. Uh, the synergy is about ECHO, sorry, ECHO and are sometimes mixed up about the names. So the synergy is it's with ECHO, and the revenue, it's about what would it be without ECHO. Uh, we, I will give uh, the floor for Abderrahman and uh, for the synergies, but uh, I would say that for the revenue, it's it start to be difficult to answer because uh, as there were some trade flows between the companies, and it, it's not easy to answer to that. It's, but uh, we can give uh, just an idea about the, the revenue last year for uh, you know the full uh, fiscal year of Ecor was one billion two hundred millions. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, yeah, 1.5 billion, uh, 1.5 billion uh, last year. So it gives you, you know, a flavor of what could be the revenue the, the, this year. And their EBITDA last year was 124, 124, 120, 120, 120, 120 million uh, euro EBITDA. Derman, do you want to speak about the synergies which we expect? Yeah, we have, I mean, you know, anticipated a synergy of an amount of 20 million. The majority of them, they come from transportation because our footprint is more important with, you know, a <coughs> core and we, 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 I mean, obviously there are some savings in the, in, um, in the transportations and there are other savings. I would say that the majority of the savings in transportation has have been uh, achieved now and we have i mean adjusted you know we put in place the rationale of the the, the movements i mean the between the purchase and and the, the the sales now there are other synergies that we are implementing and we we think that the implementation will end up by the year end, the calendar year and not the physical year end. but the, so we are planning you now 20 million maybe we will have you know, some positive news and maybe we will be beyond our expectations, but it's at least our, what we have planned. Um, uh, there is a question about uh, what would have been the EBDA without the ECHO in, over the H1. Um, so you have the figures in the, in the pre presentation. It would have been uh, 44.8 million less. Um, can we have an idea uh, of the remedies in terms of EBITDA? Um, not so easy to answer to that question, uh, but roughly I would say uh, 20 to 25 million euro under current e economic uh, conditions, which are very good. Of course, uh, if the market were uh, even better, it, it would be higher, and if it is uh, worse, uh, it would be less than that. Uh, there is no deferred contingent payment related to the ECO acquisition. Um, there are some questions about the process of the sale of ECO, uh, of the remedies. We have already spoken about that. We will not give the, the value of the sale uh, uh, tonight. We will say it uh, when it is uh, completed. Um, the process were already, may, but maybe uh, some of you were late. Um, so we are we have selected one bidder, and we have to conclude uh, before June 16. So we are working very hard on the uh, legal documentation, but it is fairly complicated because uh, uh, there are some notary which have to to take place. There are eight sites, uh, which means uh, eight contracts. Uh, there is also some uh, French ICP regulation uh, involved in that. So uh, it's indeed a fairly complicated process, but uh, we expect to be on time. Um, 
a question about the gross margin per ton uh, at H1. Uh, indeed, we do not answer to that question because we do not want to give hints to our uh, competitors. Uh, but you can, um, if you take uh, with, with a uh, in the bridge, in in the bridge. Sheet, you can. Uh, in the EBITDA bridge, there is a you know uh, an explanation. I mean, uh, how much uh, in the, the the gross margin has improved? Unless I've missed the question, I think it's all for the questions of, uh, for the H1 results. And after that, we have uh, questions about uh, the earlier acquisitions. Uh, just left me one second to, sum to summarize them. So uh, there are some questions about the price, which was such a high premium. Um, so you have seen on, on the chart uh, which we have disclosed that uh, uh, the magnitude of the premium depends of the horizons uh, which you look at. Of course, it's, there is a big premium uh, if you look at the spot price, but if you look at a one year period, uh, because I think there was a bit of uh, uh, the market was not conf confident with your anymore since uh, the dismissal of uh, uh, since the res resignation of the CEO and uh, well we were not very sure that the share price on a day-to-day -day basis was uh, representative of the intrinsic value so if you look on a larger uh, horizon uh, magnitude uh, three months uh, six months or one year you see that the premium is much lower also, uh, one issue, um, Beam had the largest shareholding uh, in uh, Elior, uh, three times uh, the shareholding of the next uh, shareholder. Of course, it's not a controlling uh, um, share, but it nevertheless deserves a premium. We can stay, we can speak for uh, hours or even more than that if the if the premium is uh, low, high, but it's a premium that the group was uh, ready to pay for uh, this uh, 47 uh, percent. There are some technical questions about the earnout mechanism. Um, indeed, uh, it starts with a share price at 5.65 euro, and roughly uh, uh, most of the accretion value for the two years uh, because this uh, earnout is between January 23 and uh, uh, December 24. If uh, the share price uh, exceeds uh, for a certain period uh, at, the, at the end of the of beam uh, 5.65 euro, which we, I repeat, we will be very happy if it happens. Um, most of the value is attributable to BIM uh, with a cap at 1.635 euro. Uh, why is, uh, did we not pay uh, immediately uh, this amount? Uh, it's not, it does not depend on us. It's an agreement between the parties. Uh, then we have some uh, question. Uh, there are some questions about the negotiations. Um, I would say it's not very interesting. Um, what I just can say is that the negotiations were very, very short. Uh, and then we have some question about the rationale of the investment. Um, what is our investment horizon? What are the targeted synergies? What do we, cons uh, how do we consider the your debt. Um, so we will first answer that these questions. So um, investment of horizon is very long term. Uh, everything that the group does is long term. We are not uh, financial investors. We are industrial investors. And uh, Mr. De Riesburg and uh, together we have the Amanda here. Uh, they have a long-term strategy. Uh, that's what we can answer on that. So it, it means that there will be no rapid synergy. Uh, we're aware of that. 
uh, as I said before, we will be uh, observers at the board. Uh, we will try to, to see if it makes sense to answer together to some uh, bids on the uh, multi-service market. But first, we have to answer the bids, be awarded the contracts, and then start uh, uh, delivering the service and uh, have the synergies of that. But uh, it will take some months. Bernard, do you want to uh, add no, something? I mean, no, no, I, I think that you have said it all. It just uh, there wasn't this opportunity, and uh, I mean, we took it, and uh, we will see, I mean, in the, the near future, how the evolution of it. Um, additional questions about the earlier uh, minority stake investment. Uh, if we will go up to the 30%, um, what uh, you know in the declaration of intent, we say that we do not exclude to to buy additional shares. Uh, so you will see uh, the developments on that matter. Uh, about the debt of LEO, uh, of course, it's a significant debt, 1.2 billion euro. We are aware of that. Uh, as of now, um, as I said before, uh, we are uh, minority investors. Uh, we are we have two seats at the board. Some of you have, um, because we already have contacts with some of our, our analysts, some of you has uh, asked us uh, which are the next steps um, we want also to answer that questions. Uh, the story, uh, the next pages, they are not written yet. Uh, maybe if we meet in uh, six months or five months, three months, one year, it depends. Uh, maybe we will be in the same position and nothing would have uh, uh, happened more. And maybe we will have uh, some uh, small GVs uh, and uh, contracts. Uh, Maybe uh, because some uh, some of you have uh, said to us uh, they have a service division. We we have a service division. Would make would it make sense? It's uh, very too early to speak about that. Uh, first, we are at the board and we will observe. Uh, just an additional point about that. Uh, some of you have uh, asked for us uh, how it impacts our ratios. Uh, what we can say is that uh, with the current level of the EBITDA of the group, uh, it impacts our uh, debt to EBITDA ratio, but the money that we are committed to uh, in LIO by 0 0.3 uh, uh, term of uh, EBITDA. So we are at 1.12. It would impact by 0 0.3 more. I think we have answered the most of the questions, or nearly all the questions. Uh, uh, there, there is another question uh, about uh, so it's uh, about the Dorishbourg group, not Elior. If is the what, uh, 50, 559 million euro EBITDA a target for the world exercise? Um, I would say uh, that uh, the market conditions which prevailed in order to deliver uh, this EBITDA, uh, they were um, under, I would say, steadily increasing prices which enabled us to make uh, the, the profits which we expect to each unit margin that we uh, sell, because you know that we try to work with fixed unit margin. And, and in addition to that, uh, we made, I would say, extra margins due to our inventory, which we try to be as low as possible, but with, which is nevertheless uh, a few hundreds of tons, 200 tons, uh, I would say, 250 thousand tons 
and we made extra margins on that, both of ferrous and ferrous and non ferrous metals. And uh, over H2, in order to do the same, it would mean that the price would, I would say, it implies the underlying assumption that the price continue to, to increase. I would say it was the case in April. It was not the case in May because the prices started to decrease. We don't know how it will take place in June, uh, but I would say that we have at least one month where we will not have uh, this uh, the actualization of this assumption. But at the same time, I would add, uh, Pierre, that uh, on a like-for-like -like basis, uh, the cumulative numbers as of the end of May will be better than the last year. I mean, taking uh, the Rishibur alone on a stand basis, uh, on, on a stand alone basis, or taking uh, uh, GDE on a stand alone basis. So um, well, we don't know about the last, you know, four months of the fiscal year, uh, but so far, I mean, our numbers are better than the last year, combined on a stand alone basis. So I think th there are some other questions about, uh, I would say, business issues, so we, we cannot uh, answer uh, uh, under that call. Uh, so um, I think we have answered most of nearly all the questions which are on the chat. Maybe if someone wants to add an additional question. So I think that uh, I don't see any uh, pop-up of additional question. So thank you very much for uh, attending this call. Uh, we wish you a very uh, a good weekend for those we, you, because in France, uh, most of the people, uh, many will have a four, uh, four days uh, weekend, uh, not of all of us, unfortunately. And uh, we wish you, um, a very good weekend and uh, we will be happy to disclose you our half year results uh, at the beginning of December. Thank you very much. Thank you all for taking the time to attend this video conference. All the best.